The title of the talk is Credit Assignment Pathways. And we're going to start with a question, which is a seemingly simple. What changes when we learn? Or to make it more specific, how do humans or machines update the perceived importance of neural stimuli? And that neural stimuli might come from our senses or may come from some internal synapse. From, from the input layer or from a hidden layer, if we're going to use the language of uh, neural networks. And this question was, ha has a long history. Um, it was called by Marvin Minsky the fundamental credit assignment problem. And um, another deep learning researcher, Jürgen Schmidhuber, observed that the whole deep learning research community, or really any scientific research community, can be understood as a deep network of credit assignment pathways, where, where the nodes are different ideas. And the network evolves over time, giving different weight, both positive and negative, to different ideas as learning happens throughout the community. So to honor this idea, I've um, created a very small subsection of this uh, deep network of deep learning um, citations, uh, and that's on the handout that you see before you. Um, the flip side also has lots of references. I haven't been as careful about including the references in the slides because they're all on that piece of paper. Um, okay, so we're going to, we have a little, little legend there, so on the bottom in the blue are people and publications. The blue edges indicate authorship. Um, there's a red edge for, for inhibition. That's, that's a uh, negative weighting on a certain idea. Um, and then gray edges uh, indicate conceptual links. And the yellow path is the path that we're going to take throughout this morning's primer. So we're going to be jumping all around this graph. Going to be a fun ride. We start with the perceptron. Um, this is a very simple model, linear model. Um, but it was really the first one that was demonstrated to learn from the input um, in this sort of bottom-down fashion, which we're going to be doing throughout this whole morning. Um, very simple model. Just has one weight for each of the features, each of the input dimensions of our training data, and then sums those um, numbers all together and throws it through a decision function, a step function. Uh, in this case. Okay, but before we use this nice little classifier, we need some data to work with. Um, so, our first data set has the axes weight and uh, domestication or ferocity, and there's a star there because the x-axis for ferocity is my own subjective uh, determination, not meant to offend anyone's personal beliefs about the things we are um, plotting here, which are going to be cats and dogs um, and labels. So we have some cats and dogs plotted in this two-dimensional space, and we have labels for each of these animals telling us whether they're a dog or a cat. And we want to learn a classifier, which is going to be able to determine just from the domestication rating and the weight uh, whether this animal is a cat or a dog. So, we throw our data up into a nice little matrix, um, and we have a, a very simple model, right? So it's really just going to learn these two numbers, a weight for weight, for, for how much this animal weighs, and a weight for ferocity. And we're going to tune these weights until we have a, a good way of classifying um, whether the animal is a cat or a dog. Importantly, we have a learning rule. We have a way of updating these weights based on the current model's predictions. Uh, and, it's, and it's very simple. And we're just going to go through this toy example until we have a nice classifier. Uh, a few more details. We don't, we don't want to force this classifier to only um, to, to go through the origin. Right? So, so we want to give it, allow it some bias. So we're actually going to learn three weights. The weight for um, kilos, for, for how much the animal weighs, the weight for ferocity, and a bias. Um, 
And the, the model prediction is just gonna, just like that picture showed, multiply each feature by the corresponding weight, sum them together, and then throw it through a decision function. The decision function you see here. Um, and it's basically just the sign function. If the output is greater than, greater than zero, then we'll output a one. We'll, we're gonna say, this is a cat. If the output is negative, less than zero, we're gonna say, this is not a cat. Um, and you can pretty much forget about that B, because the B is absorbed into this one, this column of biases here. Um, okay, and, and now let's take a little deeper look at our, our learning rule. Over here, you see the cost function. And it's as simple as it gets. It's just the difference between our model's prediction, which again is just the sum of the weights pumped through the decision function, and the actual truth. DJ is that column of truth, which we were supplied by some magical oracle who knows how to tell cats from dogs. Um, so we take that difference. If we're correct, this is zero. So this all collapses, and what we do when we're updating the weight is absolutely nothing. We just carry over the previous weight. Um, so now let's, let's work it through. Um, we, okay, sorry. So we initialize everything to zero. Here are our starting weights, bias weight, weight weight, and ferocity weight. And we pump it through the model. The model multiplies all the features by zero, gets surprisingly zero, and f of zero is zero, that's our decision function. Um, and so we're wrong because this is a main coon cat and it's supposed to be, give us a one when it goes through the decision function. So we are gonna update these, these weights and the way we update them is simply by um, multiplying the, the difference between the, the target and our prediction by the actual input feature vector. So now our weights are simply the main coon cat's feature vector. One, eight, negative four. Good? Okay, now we've got our second training example. Boom, pump it through the, the perceptron. Multiply the bias by one, multiply the weight by our weight weight, multiply the ferocity by our ferocity weight. We get f of 261. That is one, that's a positive number. So we say the Labrador is a cat. And eh, wrong. So now our cost function is zero minus one, negative one. So now we update the weights with the, with the negative of this feature vector for Labrador. So we take um, one minus one gives us zero. Eight minus 30 gives us negative 22 and negative four minus negative five gives us one. Um, we continue. We now have our Persian cat, pump it through the decision function, get a negative number, oh my goodness, we're wrong again, uh, have to update their weights, we update them, got new weights. Then on the pit bull, uh, we get our first right answer. And notice when we get a right answer, nothing happens. The, the weights stay the same after this iteration. Okay, but then we come back to the uh, main coon, and unfortunately we're wrong. We have to update the weights again. Go to the Labrador, we got that one right, no change. Go to the Persian cat, and we're wrong again. Update, and I think we're there. Yeah, so we have now Learned a classifier, classifying cats and dogs. It gets 100% accuracy on this incredibly uh, robust and deep data set of four animals. Um, and it's a fair question to ask, what did it learn? Well, it learned a decision boundary. And, and actually, even before we plot it, we can just look at the numbers and know, okay, it learned weight and uh, ferocity correlate negatively with being a cat. So, uh, no offense to uh, the, the dog folks in the room, but that's what this model has picked up. Um, and, we, and we can look more precisely exactly at what the decision boundary it has learned and plot it in our, 
feature space. So this is a, a linear separation between our cats and dogs. That's pretty cool, right? We didn't need to know anything about cats or dogs beforehand, and of course this data is not limited to things we're very familiar with. This could be totally uh, unseen data that we just have features for, and we could learn a classifier like this. Um, so people were very excited about this technology, and, and there's this beautiful way in which that answer emerged from the bottom. There, there was no expert telling us, oh yeah, cats, cats don't get that ferocious, or dogs are really big. We, we didn't need any of that. We just needed the labels and, and the description. So, so people were really excited about this ability of machines to learn. And, and one um, very relevant to us in the room uh, application of the perceptron was on to DNA. Um, so in order to do that, we're going to need to encode our DNA in a uh, matrix. And the sort of prototypical way to do that is via a one-hot encoding, where we have a row for each of the bases. And any time the sequence had that particular base, we give it a 1 um, and zeros everywhere else. So you notice that 1D sequence becomes a 2D matrix. Um, and then, from that, with that as our input matrix, what the perceptron is going to help us do is learn what's called a position weight matrix. So for each weight, I'm um, sorry, for each position, at each position, what is our uh, expectation for seeing a particular base? Um, so w one way to do this is to make um, multiple sequence alignment, stack them up, and just count how many bases you see at each position, and that becomes what's known as the position frequency matrix over here. Um, and it's just the raw counts. And then you can sort of assume some background distribution on the bases, and, and commonly we just assume they're uniformly distributed. That's not true, of course, humans. Uh, so, so the true GC content of various species across the whole genome is shown down here, but for, for the purpose of this talk, we can assume there's a, a background distribution of uniformity. Um, and then the position weight matrix, which encodes our sort of surprise at seeing what whatever base occurred, um, is the, the log of the ratio of the, the actual count divided by the expected count, which, if we're assuming uniform, would just be 0.25 for each of the bases, and we take the log of that, and that, that gives us this, uh, our log odds ratio for each position and each base. And this is a motif detector. It, it's a way of finding specific sequence patterns in the genome. Um, and, and another word for this is convolution. This is sequence convolution. And we're going to do a little practice in our heads by taking this motif detector constructed from this position frequency matrix and convolve it with this input sequence. So the challenge for the next 10 seconds is to turn this input sequence vector into a one-hot matrix and then convolve it with the position weight matrix given uh, graphically over here, and then develop an expectation for what, what the output will be when we convolve, when we slide that position frequency, uh, that, that motif detector across this input. What will we get? Boom. Right? At the very end of this sequence, we see the sort of most dominant uh, motif in this motif detector. So that gives us a big output. So th this is why we call these motif detectors, because um, when the sequence contains the particular weighting of that, um, of that detector, it, it has a big output, and otherwise the output is small. So, so it's a way of detecting when that motif is present. Um, just some little details. If we're convolving, the, the size of the output is shrunken by the size of the filter, plus one, um, for, for our activation. 
And what we really did there, if you were playing along, was actually cross-correlation, not convolution. Convolution includes flipping the matrix, um, the, flipping the, the detector matrix. In, in various libraries, they implement one or the other. When you're learning these motif detectors from scratch, it doesn't really matter um, which you implement, so long as you're consistent. Um, and what do we learn when we uh, train a, a system of many of these uh, position weight matrices on the task of variant filtration? Well, we learn some very familiar motifs. So one, yeah. Question. Can you go back to slide? Sure. So the plot, uh, can you show the graph again? How does that curve relate to the, if we imagine that uh, in the first step we're kind of creating a generative, like a generative model for sequence, like you're basically saying in each position the probability of seeing each letter, how does the value of that graph relate to the probability of a so this would be an application. So here we developed a, a motif detector, right. and here we applied it. Does that make sense? Yeah. So so here we're we're looking for it. when when we develop the position matrix, we're trying to figure out what to look for, and then here we're looking for it. Right. So when you when you take the um, motif and you overlay it on a sequence of letters there. Mm -hmm. Producing a number. Yeah. Another a number that seems natural to me is like the log probability of that sequence under that motif. Is that the right interpretation of what that number is? Yes. Is yeah. Okay. That, yeah. Exactly. That's what's in there. Um. Okay. And so if we train a, a model like this on on the task of variant filtration, we get um, very familiar motifs. We get uh, lots of homopolymer detectors, and we know variant um, calling, so the task of variant filtration is, is complicated by homopolymer runs. So it makes sense that um, finding homopolymers would help you correctly classify variants. Uh, we also see a lot of GC content motifs, uh, as well as STR detectors, and we know all of these um, sequence motifs correlate with um, the ability to, to correctly call variants. We also see things like nucleic edge detectors. So here, when the base is below the line, that's a negative weight. So it's looking for things that are not T. And here, and above the line, is positive weight. So a motif like this is looking for a transition from, from not, not CNT to CNT. And similarly, uh, this motif is looking for a transition from not CNTC to CNTC. And here we have a little bit more complicated kind of palindrome detector. Um, and and this is, those are sort of cherry-picked motifs that I had found in the network that, that we trained, but this is the sort of raw output of that layer of learned motifs. So, so you can judge for yourself how much it was uh, cherry-picking. And, and there are clearly motifs in here that are not so easily easy to explain um, with, with some previously understood knowledge. So that could be a failure of, of the model or just things we don't yet have names for. Um, so let's add a dimension and now we're doing 2D convolution. 2D convolution in general can be thought of, of as smoothing. You're, you're blending these the filter together. But if you're careful about how you select that kernel, you can also make convolution uh, uh, do an edge detection. And here you're seeing the, the convolutional filter, the numbers in it, and then it applied to this sort of whole section of the image centered at the mouse. Um, and, and what you see here is a, it's picking up, oh now we're onto a different filter. Let's just start that video over again. Um, Okay, so here we're looking for horizontal lines. And now we just switched and we're looking for vertical lines. You see, because we're, the convolution takes the difference between the pixels up here and the pixels down here. One, two, one, negative one, negative two, one. You see, and you see what comes out is either horizontal lines when we're at the horizontal filter and then switch 
Oh, and now we're looking for diagonal lines. Now we're looking for this uh, Toeplitz matrix, and we're looking for right diagonal. Now we've got, uh, um, yeah. So we're switching back and forth between Toeplitz and Hankel here. We're looking for diagonal lines like that and like that, and you see how they pop out. Right here is the uh, different convolutional filter called the Mexican hat, and that's just a, uh, it sort of looks like a sombrero, and that picks up edges in, in all directions. Um, and then here we have uh, just a block filter and then a Gaussian. And there, there you see the smoothing uh, capacity of convolutions. But, but when the mean of the convolutional filter is zero, you get a natural predilection for edge detection or sequence, uh, frequency selection, um, even if the matrix is um, random. And, and one important property of uh, convolution is that it's translationally equivariant. So if you move something in the image, there will be a corresponding move in the output of the convolution. And that's, that's a really nice property because it means the things we learn for one convolutional filter can be shared all across the image. We don't have to relearn what, say, a cat's head looks like uh, at every given position in the image. Um, okay, so this, this property to recognize oriented edges, it's very powerful. And it brings us back to cats. Um, so cats also have this incredible ability to recognize oriented edges. And this very painful seeming experiment was what was able to show it. So an electrode was drilled into the cat's uh, visual cortex and um, was hooked up to a buzzer so that every time uh, a, very, a particular neuron fired, the, the buzzer would ring. And I'm just going to play this video because it's a sort of fascinating example Hunters of... actually listened in to individual nerve cells firing science. at the anesthetized cat so as they the presented it with different visual images. When we started working, Torsten and I, in the late 50s, we set up our first experiments and they didn't go well because at the beginning we couldn't make the cells fire at all. We'd shine lights all over the screen and nothing seemed to work. And rather by accident, one day, we were shining small spots, either white spots or black spots, onto the screen. And we found that the black dot seemed to be working in a way that at first we couldn't understand until we found that it was the process of slipping the piece of glass Bad into the edge. projector which swept a line, a very faint, precise, narrow line across the retina. And every time we did that, we'd get a response. So I love that one because it was this sort of happy accident of finding this. And they were awarded a Nobel Prize for this discovery. But it's also um, this amazing uh, fact that inside the mammalian visual cortex is these convolutional edge detectors. Um, so while we're on cats, let's go back to our little toy data set of cats. And um, we were pretty proud of how well it performed. Let's, let's um, you know, sell it to some customers and see how it does. So the customers, of course, are going to apply this to new animals, not yet in our training set. The first one they try is Basset Hound, and we get it right. We're pretty excited uh, in anticipation of the main event. We have to try it on a Vicenji. Uh, and again, we're a little close for comfort to the line, but still correctly classified. But then, unfortunately, we get a Yorkshire Terrier. And this, this fella is on the wrong side of our line. So we incorrectly classified the Yorkshire Terrier as a cat. Then we get a tiger. And again, we are way off. That, that is deep in dog territory according to our little perceptron, but we all know the tiger is a big cat. Uh, so what went wrong? The, the, the perceptron is great, Zor is it? So we, we can have an even simpler problem. Uh, just the logical Zor. Um, so if we try to train a perceptron on this problem of learning Zor, we will fail because the Zor is not linearly separable. You can't draw a single line that will separate the trues from the false. 
Um, and, and so Frank Rosenblatt is the, the person who we associate with the invention of the perceptron and, and the discovery of its learning algorithm. And he was very excited about, about its potential. Um, and in, uh, a few years after his, his book, which was called, I think, Principles of Neurodynamics, it's on your sheet, um, Marvin Minsky and Seymour Papert wrote this book called Perceptrons, which correctly described how a, a single layer perceptron cannot learn Zor. Um, and this had a huge chilling effect on neural net research. Um, but it was sort of misinterpreted. The, the book describes only how single layer perceptrons fail. But we can make our perceptrons deeper. We can add more layers. And when we do that, we have no problem with uh, simple functions like this. So, so it's largely misinterpreted, but that's why we have that red line going from Minsky and Papert's book to, to perceptrons, because there was a, a big chilling effect in response to this book and the fact that this simple function cannot be learned. Yeah? Weren't they layering up each perceptron without the step function? Is that why it corrupts? Right. Well, so if you layer perceptrons without the step function, it just collapses to linear. So, so yeah, so you, you actually haven't added any depth unless you have a nonlinearity, because you're just multiplying numbers, so that just collapses to whatever the single scale or number is. Um, when you add that, that crucial nonlinearity, um, you can learn much more complicated uh, decision boundaries, which is what we'll be doing throughout the rest of the clock. So, so this motivates why we need deep learning, and we're going to see an, another um, demonstration of that here on a new data set. Now we're looking at the famous handwritten digit um, data set of MNIST, which is probably the most well-studied um, data set in, in the artificial intelligence community. And now we're learning a shallow model. It's a little bit more, it's essentially a perceptron, but now we, we have 10 possible outputs. And where our input is every single pixel value in these input images. Um, and we're learning how to classify the different images. And you see they're sort of starting to emerge. But if you keep looking at this long enough, it should become very frustrating. Because they're not really getting to the number. Like, this is not a 9. This is not a 6. And, right? That's, that's not a 5. Anyone know what, why, what's the problem here? The problem is we're working directly in the input space. And these numbers are really well, some of them are very correlated in the input space. For example, the bottom of a 6 and the bottom of the 8 are very hard to distinguish from each other in the, in the input space. So this is a terrible place to work. The, the input res representation is difficult to, to reason with. That's the whole point of needing artificial intelligence, is that we can't just read off what we want to know from the input. We, we have to learn something. And, and we're handicapping our model here by forcing it to learn direct mappings from the input to our output space. So if we're going to traverse a deeper graph, we're, we're going to do deep learning now, we're going to need a more sophisticated algorithm to handle this. Um, and that's going to be backpropagation. So, so now we can't just update the weights by um, whether, whether we were right or wrong, because the, the weights are going to be further removed from, from the target value. So backpropagation is um, basically a, a very fancy application of the chain rule. And I think that takes us back to our furthest um, reference on our citation graph to, to Leibniz who implicitly used the chain rule, at least in one of his notebooks. Um, but, but the idea is that we, at the last layer of our model, we, we know whether we're right or wrong, right? That's where we get the response. So there, and that's just like the perceptron. You, you just check your model prediction, check what it was supposed to be, and, and you know whether you're right or wrong. So it's very easy to update those layers. What, Backpropagation tells us is how to compute the, the rest of the derivatives um, throughout the model based on that cost in, 
from the last layer. And we can back propagate these errors in an efficient way so that um, at every step we can update the weights based on the gradient of the cost function so that we are taking very efficient steps through weight space. Um, learning is not just back propagation. Back propagation gives us the error gradients, but learning requires um, first we do inference, right? So first we make a guess. And then we check whether we're right or wrong. Then we backpropagate the errors. And then we need to update our, our model. Um, and, and that optimization process, we typically use stochastic gradient descent. So some kind of um, random subset of our data is analyzed. And, and we update the weights based on that. And important to note, as, as these rock curves are um, demonstrating the performance of the learning algorithm at, at different points in the optimization, they're not just bowing out um, monotonically, right? They're moving very noisily. This is a, a non-convex optimization. We're, we're moving stochastically in this space, um, which the next animation sort of glosses over. Um, but here, this is really, really familiar, having looked at the perceptron, right? The update of the weight is what the last weight was minus, and we'll ignore these two things for now, the, the, um, the derivative of the previous layer and the activations, the derivative of that, uh, this layer, error derivative of this layer times the activation of the previous layer. That's exactly the perceptron learning rule, but just expanded to um, different layers. What we've added over here, which we didn't need in the perceptron, was a learning rate and a batch size. So now we're not just going example by example, we're looking at several examples at once, and um, we're, we're scaling the gradient by our learning rate. How big are the steps we want to take in weight space? And there's lots of different nice heuristics to make this journey faster, including using momentum, so remembering what the previous gradients were and averaging them in, or scaling the gradient based on the past few uh, iterations uh, magnitude. Okay, so it turns out with a single um, deep layer, so, so just a two-layer perceptron is a universal classifier. So you can model any function with um, just one hidden layer. But we want to know if, if that's the right way to go. Should, should you go deep or should you go wide? And, and the problem with going um, with just going wide is that you it's sort of similar to the problem when you're directly working in the input space. You need many, many more examples to learn things. Um, for each sort of bend in your uh, decision function, every time you, you see a tiger, every time you see something that didn't fit your previous boundary, you're going to need another parameter to describe that thing. So there, there, when you have only one hidden layer, there's nothing shared between the models. Um, so this, this uh, graphic here is showing how we rotate the four or we shrink the four. It's still a four. So all those transformations live on a single manifold that, that should all be labeled four. But in, in input space, they have changed tremendously. They might not overlap at all once we shrink the four down or rotate it a little bit. Which, which means that this function is very, ha, has lots of curves. It's, it's weirdly shaped. Okay, it's not, it's not linear. It's not a nice manifold. It's like got lots of bulges and, and curves. So if we're learning just um, based on templates, we, we're going to need a lot of them. We're going to need essentially one for, for every one of those curves. Um, and this, there, there are a lot of models that are like, like kernel machines, for example, like support vector machines are um, essentially doing this, right? We, we learn that last layer, but um, we don't, but it's only a single layer that, that we get to learn. And, and that is sort of an extension of nearest neighbors. You, you have to pick the neighbor um, that you're closest to. You have some definition of closeness, and then 
for every new example, you pick the example in your training set that you were closest to, or some sort of group of, of examples in your training set that you were close to. And, and where this breaks down is when we go into high dimensions. Um, because your neighbors are no longer neighbors as the, the dimension size scales. And this is when deep models become really powerful and, and more performant because they, uh, ex they have a distributed representation which shares information across these different training examples. So you don't need to sample the, the input space densely. Um, so so our, our depth helps mitigate this curse of dimensionality. And rather than learning templates, we're learning representations. And rather than, than using a kernel off the shelf like RBF or, or um, a polynomial, we learn the kernel. So we learn this nonlinear mapping into um, an easier space in which to do our linear classification. Um, and and so one example of the, what kinds of things we learn throughout this depth are in these early layers, the edge detectors, the things we've seen before. But then you start learning more intricate patterns, regular uh, textures. And then as you get deeper and deeper into the model, you start learning real object parts and, and components. And these are things that can be shared across different, lots of different classes. So, so it's a more efficient way to make use of your training data set. Okay, so, well, we've got 10 minutes. So now, now we're gonna do a little bit of a sprint and we're gonna cover 19 years of CNNs in 10 minutes. Um, only nine minutes behind schedule, not, not too bad. Okay, so, and just a quick refresher, we're, we're doing these convolutions, but we have um, color channels, right? So just as our 1D sequence became a 2D matrix, our 2D image is in fact a 3D tensor. So this is a volume, and th this is very confusing when we're first looking at 2D convolution because you're actually convolving over a 3D object. All right, so the game starts with Yang Lacoon and the Lynette, and this is in 1998. Interestingly, this is a whole like 30 years after Hubel and Weissel showed that cats are doing convolution, and, and even um, Rosenblatt in his perceptron work said it would be great if there was some kind of topographical information encoded in our neural nets, but it takes till uh, 1998 at Bell Labs for Jan Lacoon to say, oh, let's, let's share weights across space. Let's, let's not have to relearn every kernel in, when we move across the image. Um, and he developed this for um, classifying uh, handwritten digits. And this is what I think read most of the checks processed uh, electronically in, in the US for, for quite some time. And here, it's just black and white images. Um, fast forward, I don't know, about another 20 years or so. I think this was 2014. Um, and there's the AlexNet, which is the first application to more real world images. Handwritten images are pretty well constrained. This is now on a very big data set called ImageNet, where we have um, millions of images from thousands of different um, categories. One uh, important innovation was we use rectified linear units, ReLUs, rather than sigmoidal activations. This is a fancy name for something really simple. It's the max with zero. So you, you just have this sort of hinge looking function. Um, but what's nice about taking um, f of x equals the max of zero and x is that the derivative is one every time you're anywhere you're positive. There is that one non-differentiable part, but in practice, we usually don't see it. We don't worry too much about it. Um, and interestingly, this model was split in two because GPUs at the time, which was just like uh, three or four years ago, were too small to um, hold all these parameters at once. Um, but this, this won the challenge by a really big margin over the previous sort of handcrafted feature approach uh, and, and really changed the, the game in, um, in computer vision. Uh, another very uh, well-explored model is the sort of VGG model, which has um, this very simple, clean architecture. And what was great was they, they really described it well and um, offered up their weights to the community. So it's been super well studied, and it's really easy to reproduce. 
They uh, use just small kernels, so just three by three convolutional kernels. Keep in mind the three by three is really three by three by the number of channels. So in the input dimension, it's three by three by three. Um, and 500, it's a bit of a monster, 500 megabytes of weight. So we've come, come a long way from our um, three number perceptron, right? This is half a gigabyte of, of parameters. Um, but this model performed very well, and, and it was much simpler than, than previous models. So people were very excited about it. Um, one interesting game you can play with this, with any of these models, is to try and inspect what they learn with the, the stochastic gradient or, or the auto differentiation uh, machinery which underlies back propagation. You, you don't have to just take the derivative of the um, model parameters with the cost function. We can take arbitrary derivatives across this computational graph. So one um, fun way to get insight into what a model has learned is to take the derivative of, the, of an input image with respect to a particular neuron. And what's happened here is we've looked at the, the classification neurons, the, the neurons in the last layer of various networks, and we've taken the derivative of the input image with respect to them and run a few steps of stochastic gradient descent, creating an, an sort of idealized input image for that neuron. What input will excite that neuron the most? And, and here, because these are the last neurons, we know what they signify to us. So this is the frog neuron getting excited by an input. So at first, it's like, cool, that's kind of a froggy image. But, but the important thing to remember is if you show this image to the neural net, it says 100% yes, that's a frog. And if you show that to anyone in this room, they say that is an image created by a neural net that thinks it's a frog. No, no one thinks that's a frog. So, so these are clearly not yet doing the same vision uh, computations that we do. The cheeseburger, I think, is also very uh, appetizing. Um, okay, so as our models get deeper and deeper, we have to deal with this problem of vanishing and exploding gradients. So the, the gradient is exponential in the number of layers, right? We saw that, that perceptron learning rule, we just multiply by it. So you multiply by it, multiply by it, multiply by it. This is an exponential process. It's going to either decay or explode. Um, so, so this was my, this idea of vanishing and exploding gradients was coined um, by your, you again, Schmidt Huber, and he developed the long short-term memory to deal with it, which is a way of sort of insulating um, a neuron so that it always has one pathway of derivative one. Uh, that's a recurrent net. We're not really going to talk about those, but uh, this, this problem also motivated research in feed-forward convolutional nets, and um, some folks at Google developed the inception model, which uh, contains these inception nodes that, that have that sort of split parallel like this and have um, pathways that, that bypass, that allow the gradient to get through. They also contain these auxiliary classifiers earlier in the net that fed gradients directly back in at uh, not all the way at the end of the net, but in the mid layer and only, say, a third of the way through. So these are ways of dealing with the problem of exploding and vanishing gradients. They also did one by one convolutions, which sounds weird at first. That's shouldn't that be just multiplying by a number? But this is where you have to remember where we're doing these convolutions on a volume. So when we say a one by one convolution, we mean one by one convolution in space. But we have all the channels to convolve over. So what a one by one convolution really is is a learned dimension reduction, and this allowed the inception net to have similar performance as that 500 uh, megabyte uh, VGG, but only with 19 million parameters or so. Um, so. So a lot of bang for your buck with Inception. Um, they've developed it further by separating out um, a height and width in, into separate um, convolutions. And, and each one of these lines, we get another nonlinearity. So that lets us model more complex functions. And as research has progressed, things have just gotten deeper and deeper. We have now residual nets, 
where this pathway allow is just the identity function being summed back in. What's the derivative of the identity? It's one. This is another way of bypassing the problem of vanishing and exploding gradients. We let the we give the gradient a pathway to get back in the net without having to go through these these bottlenecks where it's going to get multiplied or or where it's going to get multiplied and and may explode. Um, they just keep getting deeper. Um, people have applied these to, to variant calling uh, at, at Google, where the image is essentially an IGGV, IGV screenshot, um, and, and it's the same exact network classifying whether this is a real variant or a fake variant, um, and, and, or uh, a variant site or a reference site. You can also use the same exact ar architecture for filtering. Um, and uh, that's what we're working on at DISD as well. And the last thing leading up to um, David Kelly's presentation is this idea of dilated convolutions. So all these convolutions we've looked at so far were on pretty small images. Like for Lynette, it's 28 by 28. For ImageNet, they're 224 by 224. But we, take, we can take big images now um, if you wanted to just convolve normally over a, a you know, megapixel by megapixel or a, you know, a megapixel image, we're going we're gonna to run out of parameters on, on our GPUs. Uh, this idea of dilated convolutions allows us to expand the uh, receptive fields of neurons without having a commensurate number of, of expansions in the convolution. So if we're doing regular convolution, the receptive field grows linearly with the number of layers. But by, by cleverly sort of spacing out our convolutions, we can still see, we're not missing any parts of the image, but we're, we're able to scale um, the receptive field size exponentially, as we see here, from layer to layer, um, without uh, having an explosion in the number of parameters. So that was a big innovation, um, and David Kelly uh, is applying it to genomics, which we're all going to hear about after we have our delicious breakfast. Thank you so much for inviting me to come back here. I really enjoyed the MIA seminar when I was a postdoc at Broad. I think it's an awesome way to bring together lots of folks thinking about really technical topics, although trying to apply them to exciting problems in biology. And uh, hopefully I can tell you about an example of that today. So at a high level, I'm interested in how genomes work and particularly focus these days on gene regulation. So, um, you know, every cell in the body has the same genome, but the factors that determine the different aspects of what make those cells different performing their function are modulated by the expression of genes. And what I'd like to be working towards is what I like to call a intellectually satisfying and actionable understanding of gene regulation. And I would classify our current knowledge as somewhat intellectually satisfying. We know some of the principles at play. We know that these genes have our segments in the DNA, the code for proteins, the sequences around those genes, directly around, you might call the promoter, is related to ex its expression by recruiting proteins that activate the gene. We know that there are these distal elements that also recruit proteins and somehow activate or repress the genes in ways that we're sort of still working out. Um, you know, so we understand all these things at a high level. But if you then handed me a segment of DNA and told me what sort of cell it was in and said, Dave, what, what sort of functional properties will this sequence have? Where will there be transcription? Maybe if I change the cellular, cellular environment, how would the transcription change? If there's genes, what levels would they be at? It's these sort of like prediction tasks, things that we'd really like to take our understanding of how things work and put it into a model that can then really make accurate predictions about the system 
where we're currently a little bit more constrained. And by extension, if we then are modifying that sequence with, in some cases, very small variants, which we find all the time can be associated with the phenotypes that we care about, we're also not very good at predicting how flipping that T to a C can affect the gene expression in the different cell types. And this is particularly pressing these days. I think I probably don't have to tell people here this, but um, there are a huge number of non-coding regions of the genome that are statistically associated in populations with phenotypes that we care about. And currently, there's not a whole lot we can do with these. They're not actionable without a heck of a lot of work experimentally to really dive in and figure out what's going on. So what we'd really like to be working towards here, at least you know, my take on it, is getting towards systems that can take the results of these sorts of population studies highlighting certain regions of the genome and have automated systems that can bring us towards the highest level of understanding that our computers can before we have to intervene and start to design experiments to work out the rest of the details. But sort of the high-level hypothesis here is that machine learning is uh, able to improve the state of the art with what we can do here significantly. And you can view this work in that light as one lens you can view it. So where are we now on these tasks of making predictions out of DNA sequences? Well, we're getting pretty good at working at a more local, simplified version of the problem. So if you give me a smaller sequence and you ask, what are the functional activities happening on this sequence? Maybe you're interested in something like, is a certain transcription factor binding this sequence? And that's a problem we know a little bit more about. It's a bit um, easier to sink your teeth into. We know there are these motifs. We can do motif searches and uh, start to make estimations of whether it will be binding or not. So the state of the art a few years ago, there was position weight matrices people were using and slightly more complex versions that were able to bump things up a little bit. And there's some other folks using different types of machine learning, string kernels and support vector machines. But, um, you know, there was this powerhouse train of deep learning coming down the tracks and... Uh, it seemed like some of the methods that people were using for image analysis would also be applicable for the sorts of problems we want to tackle here. So as Sam outlined, we, um, we and others started playing around with convolutional neural networks for analyzing biological sequences, DNA sequences in this case. So I'll give you just a quick overview um, for anybody who didn't catch the, the primer this morning. So we have a sequence coming in. We want to represent it in its simplest form mathematically, which is to have four rows representing the A, C, G, and T. And in each position of our sequence, we kind of tick the box associated with that nucleotide. We call that a one-hot coding. Then you have this bank of convolution filters, which are basically little weight matrices that are going to learn to recognize certain motifs in the sequence. And you're going to scan those across the sequence, and you're going to form a new matrix that represents how much affinity that weight matrix had for that position in the sequence. And when it finds the motif that it's learned to recognize, then you're going to send forth a positive signal like this one. The rest might be negative, and we're going to impose this rectified linear unit um, which, yes, is an overcomplicated way of saying we're going to get rid of all the negative values and just focus on the positive signals coming through. And then typically we're going to do some sort of pooling operation in order to uh, decrease the size of the representation of our sequence. And uh, often that takes the form of a max pooling. We just look at adjacent positions and take the max. And the intuition there I think is pretty clear. If I recognize a motif in position I versus position I plus 1 of a large sequence, it probably doesn't make a huge difference for making accurate predictions. And then in the end, we started with a matrix. We ended with a matrix. And so there's no reason that we can't be repeating this operation multiple times, doing another layer of convolution, doing another nonlinearity, and another pooling operation where we're kind of Shrinking the length of the sequence 
but increasing the depth of our representation. And you can think of the rows of this as picking up on different features of the sequence. Maybe after the first layer, it's a bunch of simple motifs that you're representing. And after a second layer, maybe you're starting to pick up on more complex things like combinations of motifs or a motif in a GC content environment that's more conducive to binding of the protein. And then ultimately, we'll have a, a matrix that will just kind of plug into a simpler sort of classifier. If we're trying to predict that a protein is bound or not, then we might do a softmax style classification, or maybe we just do a regression on some sort of activity level. Okay? The spirit of this seminar is that you should ask lots of questions, and I'm ready for that. I'm going to be too short if you don't. We don't want that. Okay. So the convolutional nets tackling this problem um, really, I think, moved the bar in, uh, in an exciting way. So the focus here, this was the initial attempt I did at this with in collaboration with Jasper Snook over here. And um, you know, we tackled this data set of 150 DNA-seq experiments. And if you're not familiar with DNA-seq, you can think of it as a readout of the binding of all of the different proteins in the cell. You're basically focusing on any region where this enzyme, DNAse, is not able to cut the DNA. So you need a model that can predict not just binding of one transcription factor, but kind of binding of all of them, and maybe some more complexity if there's code to kind of moving the nucleosomes to free the region and get this accessibility. So it was a nice application, I think, of the CompNet because you really needed this bank of a lot of different filters picking up on a lot of different motifs to make good predictions. And when we trained models on that data in the human genome and tried to predict DNA hypersensitivity sites, it worked much better than what we were able to do before. And really, that sort of, that architecture would be applicable to any sort of peak data set that you come across. So it focused on the DNAs, like transcription factor chip seeks or any sort of histone modification chip seek that gives you a punctate peak. It would be uh, appropriate to use that style model. So that was great. Okay, we have some models that give us reasonable predictions for kind of local features on the DNA. But we still have the fact that these sequences exist in these huge chromosomes that are not just, you're not just interested in these local features, you're interested in much broader, more complex features that take into account lots of different types of genomic element. So that was a, yeah. The last slide, so you're, you're trying to predict based on sequence whether or not that part of the DNA sequence will be accessible or not accessible. Um, but you have many different cell types. So is that one model trained per cell type, or is it a model <coughs> based on this kind of data across many cell types? What was the start? Yeah, great question. So that was something that I came in with um, and, and learned something about, I think, to the project, which is that we did it as what we call a multitask learning problem. So you put the sequence in, and you're doing several layers of convolution, and then at the end, you have this representation of the sequence. Maybe it's like a 500 length vector. And you're asking that vector to then make a prediction for all 150 cell types that I have DNA hypersensitivity for in one go. So you have to kind of transform the representation of the sequence into this new space of accessibility where you can make reasonable predictions about all of these different cell types. And so the last layer then is basically just a little logistic regression on a whole bunch of different tasks. And it, that turned out to work much better than running any cell type individually and the intuition, I think, is that there's lots of shared information across these cell types. I mean, most simply, the protein CTCF is very prominent in accessibility, and it's there in every cell type. So there's no reason you wouldn't want to learn from all of these different experiments that you've done, rather than just uh, one in isolation. And that's true for lots of these transcription factors, right? That 
there's many different cell types where they're active. And so to the extent that you can share information, you end up getting better predictions. And um, I think that's a kind of a sometimes overlooked exciting aspect of what we might be able to do as computer scientists in biology right now. There's tons of data sitting in public databases that if you were able to of transform and represent it in a reasonable, accessible way uh, could help you make predictions at modeling the data set that you just generated yesterday and have on your computer that you're studying. And um, yeah, I haven't figured out how to do that yet, but it's something to think about. Uh, so two questions. The first thing is, uh, if I understand correctly, so you first uh, use DNA's data to call pigs, and then you use these pigs to define your uh, positive and negative examples instead of using the DNA's sequence directly for your input. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. Okay. So in that work, we were working with the peak calls from the um, consortiums that we grabbed the data from, so the ENCODE and Epigenomics Roadmap. Um, that was a, a nice entry point. Yeah, yeah. And another question is, I just wonder, how long does it take to train your model? Yeah, that's a good question. So you can get by. For, so first off, in case it's a hidden secret, you need a GPU to do these things effectively. Um, that makes it go much, much faster. And um, that model, geez, I'm trying to think. I can, I can get you, you can get 99% of the accuracy I got, like 99% of the way there in the training in probably two or three days, ballpark. But I typically let it train for longer than that because, you know, it's my life. <laughs> I got time. <laughs> yes. Of each conventional layers, so first, so you showed the motif that you choose define the first steps of the hidden layer. I'm wondering, uh, is this there is a limit, like how many motif you can use, and what is the depth that <coughs> in the next like uh, hidden layer? Yeah, great question. So how do you choose? I hear two questions. One, how do you choose how many filters are most appropriate, and there isn't sort of a exact science to this. You know, one way that people go about it is they try 100, 200, 300, 400, 500, and you have a holdout validation set, and you measure your accuracy, and you make the decision based on that. Jasper's expertise, my collaborator on this, was Bayesian optimization, which is a way of letting those we call them hyperparameters of the neural network, number of filters, the learning rate, um, if there's a momentum in the optimization, all of these things that you can't optimize directly very easily, you call them hyperparameters, and there are some strategies that uh, choose a next set of hyperparameters in a very smart, principled way to try. And so we did a lot of optimizing that way uh, letting Jasper's software search the space and ultimately decide that typically I was in the in the 200 to 300 filter range for the first layer. Now for the depth, depth I think is is the way people talk about it sometimes gets confusing. So certainly for convolutional neural networks, depth is pretty intimately tied with the pooling that you do. So if, say I wanted to pool by 10 every layer. I really can't even go that deep because suddenly my sequence is going to be condensed down to nothing. But if you pool very lightly and you go very deep, then sure, you can get yourself to a dozen layers or so here pretty easily. And I would say that's about where it saturates. I mean, that's again into the realm of like, I've taken the time to sit through these things and let them train and see if it's better. And yeah, you can squint and it's a little better but it's not a huge difference. But I think getting past the first layer and getting several layers in so that you're not, so that you can pool lightly is uh, beneficial. Cool. Just to be okay. explicit, just so there's no confusion, the filters, you're choosing the number, you do not choose their content. 
Right. Right. Yes. Yes. So these are weights that are free parameters that you're going to be doing stochastic gradient descent over. Initially, they're randomly chosen. So the first time it's, you start throwing sequences through this thing, you more or less get gibberish. But, you know, magically it works eventually. You take steps towards more useful things. The motifs that are useful for making predictions ultimately zero in on one of the filters that started kind of in that direction, and it eventually becomes something useful. Cool. All right, let's tackle something harder. So I guess I thought next, if we're reasonable at making good predictions about local regulatory elements, then OK, I have this model for how transcription occurs in my mind that's, you know, probably heavily influenced by papers people in this room have written. But if I can go through that sequence and pick out things that look like, say, accessible regions, regulatory elements, promoters, enhancers, insulators, whatever else we can come up with, that's great. And by using the convolutional net where I have these filters and I can sort of go back and figure out which nucleotides matter, I can even start to pick out the motifs that are driving that accessibility and regulatory activity. That's great. And CTCF is really easy to pick out with these the DNA models. And so um, in many cases, CTCF forms these insulator elements such that if you identify that you have this promoter of a gene here, or you, I mean, we know where all the genes are, so you know this is, this is here. And you see this distant regulatory element, then maybe it's not too hard to then build into the model this sort of logic that if you're blocked by an insulator element, then maybe you're less likely to interact with the promoter over here. Even though you're closer in linear space, you're less likely to be close in three-dimensional space because of this folding. Kind of opening a can of worms here, hoping you guys are familiar with this stuff. I'm thinking yes, because of Jesse and others. <laughs> Um, but maybe you're more likely to interact with this promoter. And so can we then sort of build that into a model? And OK, now we think like this sequence is relevant and this sequence is relevant. So I can compute some function of that to guess at what the expression of the gene might be. And I think that would be pretty cool. So the workhouse workhorse data that I'm going to use to try and tackle this is the CAGE experiment. It's called CAP analysis of gene expression. The idea is that we're going to grab the 5' prime methyl cap of the mRNAs and sequence off that. So you are sequencing steady state mRNA levels. So it's, it is a measure of mRNA abundance more so than transcriptional activity. But it concentrates all of the energy of that gene expression onto the transcription start site. And if we're thinking about making predictions about the gene's expression, that has a lot of nice properties for us. Um, the alternative you might think is, OK, if I grab some RNA-seq data sets, and with RNA-seq, the coverage for a gene is distributed all over the place. And um, maybe I'm getting ahead of myself, but I'm thinking about predicting that coverage profile and the RNA-seq means you have to learn a lot more things, like splicing. So CAGE is nice. It's also nice because there's a consortium called Phantom 5 that performed the experiment, about 1,000 different, 1,000 experiments, probably about 500 different unique human cell types, and a bunch of mouse cell types, too. So it gives us pretty, pretty good coverage across the body and across some different uh, cell lines and cancer states and... How does this compare with the like, poly-A tail fold out, or is this the same thing? Strongly correlates. Not the same thing, but strongly correlates. Okay, because that's more just like, then you don't care about the splice as it forms either. If that oh, sequencing the ends of Yeah, the if you just cell. grab them all by the tails, which is, I think some of yeah. do. Yeah, yeah. Single cell especially, right? But. So my intuition there would be that, OK, rather than concentrate, the cage is going to concentrate the thing you want to predict here. And the poly A might concentrate it right. somewhere down here. So now you suddenly need to ask the convolutional net to identify termination sites, right. like where is transcription going to stop? So and um, there's a paper out there that does that, Brendan Frey's group at uh, Deep Genomics, because okay. it is something that matters. 
but um, it's a bit of a different beast. Okay, so you're concentrating, you're looking at the activity at the start site, which is kind of what you're aiming to predict anyway. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so in addition to that cage data set, <laughs> I put in all of the previous data that I have been studying, the DNAs, and a whole bunch of chip seek histone modifications too. Uh, hoping, not quite as interested in that data, but hoping it would help to learn those distant elements and chromatin states so that you can make good predictions. And ultimately, like I mentioned, um, I want to work with the continuous signal tracks across the genome this time. So we talked about how last time with the DNAs, we were looking at the peak calls. And that's a pretty rough compression of the data. We're suddenly going from this continuous signal track to a zero one, either it's a peak or it's not. And you know, when you look around these things in the browser, you see big peaks and little peaks. And is there a difference? I don't know. And in particular for the cage, there's a huge dynamic range. We definitely wouldn't want to compress that to peak calls because you'd say something that's expressed at, the cage doesn't use FPKM, but let's just say it for the second. If it's 10 versus 100, transcripts in the cell, then um, maybe those are both peaks, but it's a 10x difference. We want to model that. We want the algorithm to pick up on stuff like that. So that offers a variety of new challenges for the processing of the data. And uh, this is what I came up with. Basically, the other thing about these black box neural net models is they're really good at learning the things you care about, like the relationship between the motifs and activity. They're also really good at learning whatever bias got into the experiment. So if you have some sort of GC bias in your sequencing, that neural net is going to be really happy to learn what that is and increase its accuracy on the loss function you gave it. So I really tried to get all of these potential biases out. It's still an inexact science, but we're trying to normalize for GC content. I'm trying to be as smart as I can about distributing the multi-mapping reads so I don't have these, like, empty blocks in the genome. And that was particularly important to me, too, because I think these are really fascinating potential regulatory elements. There's a lot of literature about how transposable element that inserted 10 million years ago has now become an enhancer, and it's all very cool. So I wanted to study these things, which required a new processing pipeline. Could you expand on that, like maybe in the example of GC? Uh, what do you mean by normalizing a GC to get rid of this bias? Sure. So typically, it's a sequencing experiment. Let's take like a chip seek. It's a sequencing experiment. So you're grabbing a fragment from the genome that was protected by the protein or grabbed by the protein, cross-linked to the protein, and pulled down. So you have this fragment. And then beyond that, it has to go through a series of stages to actually sequence that DNA, one of which is, for example, a PCR step yeah. where you're having to amplify the DNA. And that's one step where you can get a bias like this, where if you plot the number of PCR copies you made versus the GC content of that sequence, then there's a relationship. So the simplest way to try to normalize it out is to just look at the where your reads land, estimate the fragment length of that read. If it's paired end, it's easy. You have the two boundaries. If it's single end, you kind of have to guess where it stopped. But um, then use that to kind of weight the read differently. If GC content means I expect more reads and it's high GC, then I'll downweight it a little bit. But um, people are still working on how to do these things well. Have you observed that you get better results? Or does it just feel right? Yeah, it's kind of hard to define. Yeah, it's hard to define better. Because the accuracy will be less. But you've yeah, taken away this well, thing that you don't want it to learn. Yeah. So you really need to go downstream and like think about the tasks that you want to use the model for, doing things like variant interpretation. Sure. And then it's a little harder to compare. <coughs> so mostly it just makes me feel It feels great. Right. And one hopes that the interpretable aspects of yeah, what's learned exactly. map on the real biology more than biases. Mm -hmm. And that, that bias varies from experiment to experiment. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Exactly. Okay, so having processed all this data, the machine learning problem I want to propose is that you give me the DNA sequence above this region. The genes are 
there, we know about them, but they're not being fed into the model. It's just the DNA sequence, drawing them to help you understand. And then I want to predict across the sequence how much activity I'll see in each of these data sets. Okay. So we're going to use a similar architecture to what I was doing with Bassett where we're going to use a convolutional net operating on DNA. The first few layers of this thing are going to be very similar. So the sequence is going to come in as a one-hot encoding. This time it's going to be a much larger sequence. When we we're predicting peaks, we we're working with approximately, it's kind of funny actually, I started with 300 because I thought, how could you need anything past 300? And then I doubled that, and it got better. And then I doubled that, and it got better. And I thought, where does this end? Well, it doesn't end, actually. So here, we're bringing in um, over 100 kilobases of sequence, and I'd like to do more. It's become an engineering problem, because if your GPU runs out of memory once you start running all these convolutions over it. So that's why I write broad, because I hope each time I give this presentation, I've increased the size. But we want it to be really large so that it can capture, the idea is we really want to capture how distant regulatory elements can influence gene expression, so we need it to be big. Um, and again, these elements I'm drawing for your understanding, they're not labeled on the sequence. So then we're going to do the, the typical Bassett-like thing of having a bank of convolution filters that we bring across the sequence, recognizing patterns, and doing a pooling operation so that we're starting to synthesize regions of the sequence into these vector representations that kind of capture all of the different motifs we've found. <clears throat> okay. So here, here was, in my mind, the big research problem on the machine learning side. And I had a few ideas coming in uh, of what I wanted it to look like. But the task is, Okay, if this is a promoter, and we've recognized some motifs in that promoter, well, that helps you make a prediction about the gene's expression, but it's not sufficient because we know there's all this enhancer regulation. So how do I inform this bin here about this other stuff very efficiently so that it knows it's there and it can use it to make predictions? Um, so Sam talked a little bit about recurrent neural networks, and uh, maybe some of the other presentations in MI have covered this. That would have been a model that would walk across the sequence. It would be looking at each element, synthesizing what it saw, and moving that information forward. So I really tried to make that work, <laughs> but it did not. It did not work better, that is, than what ultimately I zeroed in on, which is called dilated convolutions. And thank you, Sam, also for discussing what that is. So the dilated convolutions are a pretty simple generalization of the straightforward convolutions. So let's think about having a, a width three convolution filter, but then each subsequent layer, I'm going to move the two endpoints of the filter farther away. First, I'm going to have them one away, then two away, four away, eight away. And as I go out, OK, I'm hitting just this position. But this position has seen all these other positions, because it's doing the same thing. So the receptive field, we call it, the range of sequence that I've now shared some information through grows exponentially or geometrically uh, each subsequent layer, so that I can, in a few layers, with not a ton of filters, share information. So suddenly, this promoter has seen these more distant features of the genome. And then this dense connect thing gets into this idea of um, deeper networks having some optimization trouble with passing gradients through. And this issue that as you're continually hitting a nonlinearity and having to take gradients through that, the gradients can become very small so that you're not getting good information up here. So the dense connection means each time I run a convolution layer here, I'm sending it all the way forward to the end and to each of these subsequent layers. So this one is passed on to this one, this one. Actually, I kind of drew that wrong. So this one is even passed on to this one and this one and this one. I could change that figure to be even more dense. <laughs> 
Now, finally, we have for each position this vector representation that is what we saw in the original convolutions and what we saw in the dilated convolutions. So we concatenate those. And then we'll run one more with one convolution across that. So you can just think of that as kind of like a single last feed forward layer that we're going to walk across the sequence and make predictions for ultimately the coverage on this genome location and the data sets that I fed in. Cool. Cool. And this model was, after a great amount of debate, sufficiently different to give a new dog name to Descension. But my girlfriend, Steph, has not had time to draw a new logo, so that is still a best. <laughs> <laughs> New features. OK, so here's that same plot I showed you before, the typical sort of genome browser view of all the data. But now I'm showing you two tracks for each of the experiments. The first one is the actual experiment measurement of the aligned read coverage. And the second one is the prediction made by the model. So this is just kind of like an overview that this works reasonably well, that we're able to pick out the promoters, we're able to predict that pick out some of the stronger distant regulatory elements. But of course, there's still a mix of like maybe some false positives here, some false negatives here. So to give you a more quantitative feeling for that, here's one of the experiments, the DNAs. And we have the log two of the aligned read coverage on the X and the log two of the prediction on the Y. Sorry, the, the, yeah. Those, those, which one's your sure. This one's more about feel. <laughs> Just kind of like, no, okay. feels right. <laughs> Just the DNA sequence. Just DNA. Oh, just the DNA sequence. So yeah, sorry, DNA, not the DNA. But then how does any information about the cell type There's right. a training data and an input and the difference. Sorry. Good. <laughs> That's a good question, and it's, it's one that, yeah, I've, I'm still trying to figure out the best way to explain. So to make predictions for any cell type you're interested in, you have to give me an experiment in that cell type. And what I'm going to do then is train on most of the chromosomes, but hold out a couple of them. And so then when I report accuracy and I say, oh, I can predict your data set with this level of accuracy, I'm talking about having seen a bunch of data from that experiment, and now I'm testing it on some new sequences where I didn't know the answer. So the training of the model was, again, done multitask, like in the prior work, where um, it all happens in one go. So all of these convolution filters and the passing through of information it has to learn enough to predict all of the cell types at once. So, like you are showing, like, 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 Yes. So, in reality, there are about 4,500 of them. This is just to. So, there's all these things for all the cell types, and that's all multitask. And then, I'll, but then all the layers on the sequence are shared. Is that... Yes. Yeah. It's only the last layer where each experiment gets to have some of its own parameters. So that last layer is separate for each cell type and each track. There isn't really a notion of cell type that's different from Maybe track. So each track is a, a tuple of experiment and cell type. That's what I, okay. Or like a identifier given by encode. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it doesn't it doesn't have any notion of what these experiments are. No or that some of them are different. But there is some, like biologically, there is some notion of cell type that is being lost here. Uh, or if not, maybe, it's why, not, why do you think not? I, I think this, this whole yeah. multitask thing is sufficiently confusing and important to, yeah. to go into a bit more. Yeah. You say the cell type is lost, but I guess the way I think of it is I'm not telling it the cell type, so I'm not, I'm not helping it along in that way. I'm asking, I'm asking for a neural net structure that can reproduce data that it's given 
And then I can go in afterwards as a, as a practitioner of machine learning analysis who kind of understands the biology and say, okay, uh, today I'm interested in liver. So let me pull out all the experiments that were done in liver and look at what sort of predictions the model is making in those, in those cell types. So this, the notion of cell type is still there in that all these tracks are still labeled with them so that afterwards you can go in and do whatever analysis you'd like. It's just that it's not built into the architecture. So the model parameters don't know that this is a DNA-seq experiment in liver, and this is a H3K27 acetyl experiment in liver, and probably they're going to be correlated and across the genome. Um, that'll come out of it, but you have enough data to just let it rip and let it learn that. But another notion, so I said, to make predictions about a certain cell type or experiment, I need data. And so wouldn't it be nice if you could give me a whole bunch of experiments and then do a new experiment and I could make reasonable predictions about your new experiment? I think that would be great. But you've added this. The one, the one thing I care about. <laughs> okay. Good. I'll prioritize it. Um, so you now have this added challenge where you need to figure out you need to figure out features for the cell types that are are useful for then saying like you know this new cell type has these features so maybe it's going to be similar to these ones I've already seen and at the moment there's nothing built in like that but you can imagine like the abundances of all the transcription factors in that cell maybe that's a reasonable thing that you could give me and I could try and build into this thing but not today Next time. Now I have a reason to come back. Okay. So um, a lot of the experiments that I have here are replicates of each other. And I didn't do anything smart. I just fed them right in. Very dumb. But that has the nice benefit of I can now look at the predictions for those and compare them to the other replicate. And I can ask, how do the replicates compare to themselves? And how do my predictions compared to those replicates. Because in some ways, the, the correlation between the replicates, it's not an upper bound. Some people will come out and say that. It's not an upper bound on accuracy, but it definitely can kind of qualify what your expectation should be. <coughs> and we're doing pretty well. Why don't you think it's an upper bound? Yeah, why not? Well, let's say that both of your replicates are noisy then right off the bat, you could average the two of them and get a better estimate than if you had just looked at them individually. Um, yeah, I think that's the intuition. So here are all the different experiments. And on the x-axis, I'm looking at the correlation between two replicates. And on the y-axis, I'm looking at the prediction for that replicate compared to its actual experimental value. So for some of these experiments, the correlations actually aren't particularly good. And in those cases, on the lower end, it's often the case that the predictions can actually exceed the replicate-to-replicate -replicate correlation. So the version that we can produce by just reading the sequence and making a new track looks better than if you had performed another experiment and the correlation you'd see from that. When the experiments have a very high correlation, that's not as true. So we are somewhat underfitting the data on the high end, that there's aspects of the regulation that we're not currently capturing. And I could you know, talk for the rest of this time about all the reasons that might be the case. There's plenty of features that we'd like to build in about the biology, and maybe we'll get better on that. But it's a sign that we're moving in the right direction. Another thing you might ask is, how well do these dilated convolution layers really work? Do you really need this deep network that can see far across the sequence? Does that add value? So what I did here was um, chop them off and retrain it and measure the accuracy. And then for each of these data sets, we can plot how does the accuracy change as we add more of these dilated layers. And you can start to see further and further. And uh, certainly for each data set, it starts to help. 
I was probably hoping that this one would look more like this, but you know, we'll get there. But in particular, I want to highlight the broad histone modifications. These are things like H3K27 methylation and H3K9 methylation, where you see these broad chromatin regions where, in those cases, it's silenced or repressed in some way, chromatin. And in that case, it makes a lot of sense that looking further helps you make better predictions about that data because they're not necessarily as driven by transcription factor motifs underneath the peaks. There's a more complex thing going on there. And uh, one of my hopes for this project, actually, was that we'd be able to say much smarter things about what the sequence basis of these broad repressive chromatin marks would be. I think that it's exciting that the dilated layers help us do this better. And I think I am excited to see what this next data point looks like. But in the end, uh, the correlations for, between replicates for these data are kind of on the low end. So I think ultimately we need some new data sets there. You know, it's a little bit apples and oranges, but to be fair, did you compare dilated composition with max bloom? With, of, uh, with just kind of like a really large max pooling? Or, you know, a lot of layers. Yeah. Not rigorously, no. No, I did not. Okay, so all of the accuracy stuff that I showed before was just going across the genome, not centric to any sort of gene annotation, but I built up this argument early in the talk that ultimately I was interested in predicting gene expression. So if I then bring those annotations in and I look at the genes that are in my test set that I didn't train on, and I know where they are, so I can go look at the bin and see what the model made as a prediction, and then we can compare the accuracy of that prediction to the actual measurement. So here is one cell type where you have that, and we see a, a, a pretty good correlation. Here on the y-axis is all of the data sets, their distribution of accuracy. On the x-axis, I'm putting here the sequencing depth from that cage experiment. So a lot of the cage experiments here we're not sequenced as deeply as we here at the Broad like to sequence our things. Um, so it's a little sparse, and that seems to have a huge effect where if you're on the sparser end of the sequencing, you're going to be on the lower end of accuracy. So this is data point two of, I think this is going to get better as we get better data, as we get deeper sequencing and more accurate experiments that measure the things we care about. And as we can continue to engineer both architectures and um, models that can look far across the sequence. One thing you might wonder is whether these gene expression predictions are primarily just getting the median gene expression across all the cell types. Are we actually learning any sort of cell type specificity? And ultimately, this is something you care a lot about. If you want to go in afterwards and think about variants associated with disease, then you'd really like to know what cell types those variants are most likely to affect. And that requires being able to get good tissue-specific gene expression predictions. So here is a heat map of the actual data, the actual coverage data across lots of cell types and lots of genes. And now I'm just going to insert into this heat map the expressions and hope the light in the room is such that you can squint and see that it is a reasonable approximation, if imperfect. We at least do get um, some of these clusters in here. And I'll show you a different view, too, that might be more or less compelling. So here are four genes across the spectrum of how well I can get that tissue specificity. So previously, I was computing things like correlation and R squared across genes for an experiment. And now I'm flipping that. I'm computing the accuracy across cell types for a specific gene. So I can make plots like this. For a gene, I can plot all of the different 973 cage experiments, the experiment value, and my prediction, and see that, let's see, I chose these to span the quantiles. I think this is like the 95th percentile, 
seventy fifth percentile median and twenty fifth percentile from this distribution so in some cases we're not doing particularly well this protein i picked out because it's a mitochondrial protein so i can make a good argument that there's a fairly complex regulation going on that may not be um, perfectly matching processes throughout the rest of the genome and that happens uh, now and then but in some cases we are we are at least prioritizing the higher expressed cell types with the predictions yeah taking so any RNA without taking like taking so DNA right gets to different transitional programs that are distinct in different cells right yes. and you're trying to predict it just based on the sequence yes without any other information yes I mean it seems like a task that is destined to be sort of first order I don't want to say fail but not to succeed <laughs> yeah. I mean, because the, the cells are different, right? You can use the sequence to predict expression because um, something else is going on, right? Something extra. Something else is going on, but let's say that something else is that a certain transcription factor that activates a bunch of genes has gone up. So while I don't know that that event has happened, I see its footprint across the genome because I see that whenever the motif for that transcription factor is in a promoter or an enhancer, that I'm seeing the signal rise. Wait, so it's for all the other cell types for the person with that. <coughs> yeah. I think that the bad? missing link here is that he's training and predicting on cage as a measure of gene expression. So like he learned a cage model on for liver cells. Now he's able to predict uh, cage data for held out genes, also in liver cells, using the model that was trained on liver cells. So if you go back a slide, each okay. column is... So finally you train on the, the specific cell type, <laughs> and now you're, you have out some examples, and you're trying to recover this. Yeah, the statement, I trained on a specific cell type, I'm not clear on the interpretation of that. I trained on 973 cell types. But now you, so, and then in cross-validation, right, you, you have a held out sample that also has 900 cell types? Yes, from, from sequences that I didn't train on. There's no new cell types, though. I don't understand why you think the stats will work, but I may be missing something. So, each dot here, to be clear, and the first three one, each dot is the predictions of uh, the model that predict a certain experiment and the actual value of the cage tags for that experiment. Yeah. yeah. Based on looking at the sequence around these genes, which I didn't train on, but I saw how other sequences behave in that cell type. Yeah, but you're trying to do it at once for 900 cell types or 900 yes. different? Yes. But, but there is something that is making it different for each one of these cell types, right? Cage is just another measure of expression, right? Instead of looking at the entire gene, we look at the five prime caps, right? The fact that this cage doesn't change the fact that you have different cage expression profiles for different cells, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so the architecture of the model when I say it's multitask, it means it shares most of the parameters. And then in the last layer, each of these cell types has its own set of parameters. So let's say like... So at the last cell, like you do tell it the cell type at that stage. Yeah. I okay. give it, you know, the index of the cell type. It doesn't... Yeah. That's, I that's, guess it depends on what you mean by tell it so the you, cell you type. You basically generate a new feature file. space. Right, and at the end, you're, you're, you have an input which is the expression value, um, this feature space, right? And now you're using that to transfer knowledge to um, a situation where you only have the feature space, right? And but you do know you did tr like the last training step, right? Gave it feature space plus expression for a cell type. Feature space of sequences. Yes. Yeah. And then plus, it makes... plus information about the cell in that very last stage. 
it learns information about itself. Just, I so think the answer is yes. No, but the categorical variable of cell type is, yes. is given in that. Right, that's, that's a good way to say. It's the, a if, categorical if, variable. Just, well, cell type itself is a categorical variable, well, as are the different track well, labels, right? That's, yeah. that's a pair of categoricals. Yeah. And there's a different output layer for each of those pairs, right? So it's a task for cell type. Yeah. OK, so that makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. OK. But I, I did miss something. <laughs> <laughs> Good. I have a question. Yes. Um, related to this idea, uh, do you think if you added a layer at the end where you just trained a classifier to predict predict a pair of you know the experiment and cell type pair, do you think the the that that information would propagate and help transfer learning generally? You're kind of doing it implicitly because you're picking the last layer to propagate errors back, but what if you did it explicitly? Yeah. I think you could do something like that. You would have to think about what sort of features to put on the cell types that would make it useful to transfer. You know, like I have a variety of different blood cells that I've measured. So if there's some way to label those cells with a set of features that tell you their blood cells, then maybe when I show you a new blood cell, you can make reasonable predictions. But that's where I feel like um, the most interesting path forward for me, and that fits with the prior literature in this space, is to provide the abundances of proteins that determine these regulatory programs, the transcription factors, and maybe some of the chromatin proteins. So if there's more structure than just categorical types learned from data, yeah. is that a right. way of saying that? Yes. <laughs> Or not, right? but we no, right, but, okay. <laughs> okay. But you have enough, cool. as you said, there's enough data that you just make it categorical for now. In yeah. some sense, the, the notion of cell type. Right. So this model is categorical. Right. Okay, so I'm going to hop ahead, but we'll have maybe some time later if we wanted to come back. So <laughs> I'm interested in how you can use this model to maybe annotate enhancers. This is very kind of um, not fully developed, so I'm going to just put that out there as something of interest and skip past it. And it's in the paper. In order to focus on something that I think might be of more interest, which is that now that we have a trained model, we can feed in any sequence we want and get back a prediction for all of these different data sets that we trained on. So one thing you might do is take a SNP that you're interested in. You have two different alleles. You can make a prediction for one allele, prediction for the other allele. You're going to get back this prediction track across the sequence, and you can look at the differences between them. Maybe you just subtract the thing and take the mean, if you want a kind of high-level overview. Or maybe you know that there's a gene nearby that you might be interested in, and you focus on the difference at that gene. So I call this the SNP expression difference score set. And this ought to match pretty well with EQTL measurements that we're making in human populations where you go out, you find a bunch of people who have both of those alleles in the population, you measure their gene expression directly, and you look at how it's different. And uh, wonderfully, there's a great project, the Gene Tissue Expression Project, GTEx, that has done this for uh, 44 different tissues with more than 70 individuals. So we can go take a look at that data and see if the scores that I can give to SNPs with the model match up with the measurements in the population. This is a little more complex than it sounds because the population data smears the signal across the correlation of variance across the population, the linkage disequilibrium. So we had to design a clever method to get around this. Ykir was a big part of this. And we're basically, at a high level, going to distribute our annotation so that it better matches the measurement taken in the population according to those variant correlations to form an uh, assigned LD profile. So you, you kind of smear your stuff out by the LD matrix from the, yeah. you're, you're multiplying it by the It'd be LD nice matrix to go the other way, but <laughs> for, yes. For the StatGen people, you're just multiplying your thing by the LD and then comparing to the beta hats. Okay. Yeah. 
So then when I do that, I can rank the variance by the quantile that they end up in. I can kind of spread them across the x-axis. This gets a little more complicated because there are other covariates that have strong correlations with the EQTL measurements, such as the amount of variation tagged by that variant, which we call the LD score. If we also control for LD score, then we rank the variance according to this measure, which I'll call said LD, spread across the correlation matrix, then the stuff that ends up at the higher end is way more likely to be an EQTL. This is just one of the tissues, but that was true for all 19 that we were able to find reasonable matches across. And then you can plot the chi-square residuals versus the, um, the score. And you see that there's a significant correlation there, too. That's cool. Okay. And uh, so then you can also then use this to kind of really dive deep on a particular locus you're interested in. I'm going to have to skip that, <laughs> but we could do it later. And then I'll conclude by just saying that um, if you want to learn more about the method, things I wasn't clear on, <laughs> you can download the preprint from BioArchive, and the software is on the web at GitHub Calico Basenji. So just to leave with some concluding marks about where I think we moved the bar here. So I think the dilated convolutions are a promising approach. I'm going to keep using them, and I would encourage other people to try it out for cases where you have these really large sequences. If you're trying to make focus predictions, it's not as necessary. But as you grow to larger sizes, which in genomes seem to matter, they really help. We can predict cell type specific expression um, and reasonably annotate distant regulatory elements. And I think this is really useful for scoring variants, trying to get to those next stages of understanding why they might be interesting to us. Some of the things that I have on my mind next are to build up this toolkit, make it more accessible and useful for genome researchers. Um, putting interfaces on things. If you want to learn about a variant, you should be able to do it through like a browser interface rather than digging into my tens of gigabyte text file outputs. And uh, I think we can, we can really make something useful there. And then starting to move into different species. And I kind of started with human genomes, which are maybe a little more challenging than things like the worm genome. And we have folks at Calico who are really interested in worms, so that might be something we tackle next. And then also continuing down this path of giving scores to variants and thinking about how we can use all of the what I'll call functional genomics data that we're generating, measuring different things like gene expression in cells with the population data that we're measuring out in the world. And in many ways, these are telling us orthogonal things and bringing them together more tightly so that we're enhancing our ability to do both, to learn about genomes and to learn about people as a particular focus. So with that, I want to thank Yakir for his help on this project, Jasper for his help consistently throughout. And uh, a lot of this came seeded from John Rin's lab, so I'd like to still acknowledge John. <laughs> and uh, I have to plug. Calico. Um, it's uh, been working there a year as a now data scientist. It's a wonderful team that we're putting together, and we would like it to be much larger. So <laughs> we have a variety of different positions available. Uh, we're out in South San Francisco. Calico is funded by Google, so it gives us the opportunity to take on really ambitious research projects that take a long time. The focus is on aging, and that takes a long time. <laughs> so um, that makes it, in many ways, a very exciting place because you can dream big and um, take on big things and hopefully make a major contribution to human health. Okay, with that.